<laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh. It's so great to have Mr. Ron and Miss Natalie here. I appreciate the both of you for stopping through the podcast. Thanks for inviting us. Glad Good we can do it. Yes, of course. Of course. It is such a pleasure. Um, I'm sitting with two living legends. <laughs> so it is certainly uh, an honor to have this conversation with you. Uh, I personally grew up on Gullah Gullah Island. Um, when you guys were on tour, I saw you in Delaware. My parents went to uh, <laughs> take us in Delaware. So it's always been amazing. I loved how you guys just put on for the culture. Um, you know, everything was just, you know, black, bliggity black, you know, Benya Benya was black. I could tell by the hop in his polywog. Like it was just amazing. <laughs> it was amazing <laughs> to see. So again, welcome. And we're just going to have a great conversation today. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So if you can tell us a little bit about yourselves, uh, just for the listeners, so they can know a little bit about your background. Well, I was born on St. Helena Island, South Carolina, which is in Beaufort County, which is a sea island. When I was a child, sea islander was the word that we used, but it's known today as Gullah Geechee culture um, and heritage. And that heritage is from uh, the descendants of those enslaved Africans who were brought to this community on the southeastern coast of the United States for the production of cash crops, primarily of rice. And so rice heritage is something I grew up with um, and I am the ninth and last child of Henry and Kathleen Days. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I, I like that because his mama, when she said she had nine children because she didn't know how not to. And I told her, <laughs> I'm glad she didn't figure it out. Since I got nine. <laughs> so I'm Natalie. I'm actually Natalie Eldridge Days. Uh, mm -hmm. I was raised in central New York. Um, but uh, my auntie married into a, a, a Sea Island, a Gullah Geechee family, and moved her family there, including my grandma. And so um, some, wow, a long time ago when grandma was ill, um, as is often with Southern families, they pick somebody to send home. They did not ask me, send down. Um, <laughs> but I was the one who was picked to go help grandma and auntie. So... Um, I told them I'll come down two weeks, y'all. And, you know, it's been 40 years. Yes. <laughs> I met Ron uh, a few months after I got here. Um, he is not why I stayed, but I'm glad that I did. And uh, so we, he and I have been um, singing together and telling stories and doing this together for a long, a long time, decades. Amazing. Amazing. It, it was such a pleasure just uh, seeing your story, seeing how everything unfolded, even on a national uh, stage, mm -hmm. um, a nationally syndicated show. And I'm wondering for the both of you, like, how did that come about? Like, was it something that um, the show they came to you all or? Well, prior to uh, being asked to be a part of the program, uh, I had written a book. I was writing a book at the time that Natalie and I met. It's called Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage, where I had documented oral histories of community members I had grown up under. Their beliefs, customs, um, traditions, had old uh, songs, spirituals, and work songs of the community, and historical photographs from the late 1800s to 1900s. And after that book was published, uh, we scripted it into a theatrical performance that we toured the country uh, performing, bringing those stories to life. And it was at that time, uh, we, uh, our firstborn was, uh, she was potty trained on the road. Uh, we were expecting our second born and we knew that something needed to be changed. Uh, Natalie could not go into these uh, school classrooms with the, the cafeterias, cafeterias wow. with, um, <laughs> the smells that would be um, permeating. And there she was expecting and something needed to change. And it was at that time that we came in touch with Gloria Naylor. Gloria Naylor, the novelist, had written Mama Day about a fictional Gullah community. And afterwards, after the book was published, she bought a home 
on St. Helen Island and we became friends and I let Natalie take oh. over. So. Well, so yeah, Gloria's a friend. Um, she called herself, I remember when, when my daughter was born and she showed up at our house with this with this stroller that looked like a Cadillac of strollers to us. And she <laughs> said, just think of me as your rich auntie. So that was rich auntie vibes before folk were saying rich auntie. That was 30 something years ago. Right. And um, so we, we were friends. And um, some years later when I was pregnant with my son, um, she was actually having a novel option for a movie. It, it never went, but she was bringing down her friend who was going to work with her on this. And um, she brought her friend down to St. Helena and we went out late one night to eat cold chicken on somebody's porch. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> Lawrence Fishburne was to be the star and also the um, director. director of it. And the woman, as Natalie said, who was to be the executive producer of Mama Day. Uh, Disney movie, but uh, this Disney movie never came into being. Uh, during the dinner conversation, we were asked what were our views on children's television programs and responded. Our, our daughter was three years old at the time and we knew what we would like. One of the things we had hoped for for children's TV was that there would be a program that our daughter would watch and not afterwards desire that she had blonde hair and blue eyes. Yes. And uh, uh, Maria Perez, mm -hmm. who was to have been the executive producer of the movie, said that she and her business partner, Kathleen Minton, back in New York, were working on a television program idea that they wanted to pitch to Nick Jr., who was looking for a multicultural programming. Uh, she was from Puerto Rico. It to be about some enchanted, magical Gullah Island. This was her first time going coming to a Gullah community, would we be interested? Yeah. And we said, sure, but we had heard authors like that before from the performance that we did. And we never heard anything from those others who had told us um, uh, they knew people or could do something. She said when she got back to New York, she would get in touch with her business partner and then be back in touch with us. And we said, yeah, right. And, but that's exactly what happened. And um, a creative team, uh, flew down and they followed us around uh, for about a week. And um, I'm a uh, former newspaper reporter, so was Mr. Ron. Uh, Miss Natalie uh, did crafts. That's what Miss Natalie does. Yes. Uh, our, uh, uh, our daughter, we would entertain her because we would be traveling. Uh, doing performances. And when we were home, I wanted to push her on the swing and engage with her in our home environment. And that's what the, the creative team saw. And that's what they uh, produced um, wow. for this fictional Gullah, uh, Gullah Gullah Island community. The um, head writer at the time, Rackus Hyman, who I love dearly to this day, after hanging out with us, he said, okay, um, I know you don't do TV, you just be you and we'll work around that. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel okay. Cause we could just be ourselves with yes. our children. Um, my yeah. son was born, um, <laughs> you know, came in there. When we met Maria Perez, I was very pregnant. Mm -hmm. And then when they said, well, come up to New York and meet the folk at Nick so we can talk about it. I was like nine months pregnant. I said, no, nope, not, not coming. <laughs> and so then when Simeon was five weeks old, uh, we flew North with my baby. And he's nursing, so he's got to go where mama goes. That's just him. right. <laughs> so we were there in this meeting with all these executives at Nick Jr. And, and one of them, her name is Brown Johnson. She said, oh, can I hold the baby? <laughs> and I handed her Simeon, and he threw up down her black suit. And I said, this is a nice trip. Uh, <laughs> but we had a show before the end of the day. Right. Got back on the wow. top. Yeah. Right. And a year, so. within a year, it was on air. And, you know, TV doesn't work like that anymore. No. But okay. it was like that. And it, because it was grace. I, I, My general answer is to how did this happen? It was grace. As Ron said, I it was one thing traveling around the country with one child. The idea of traveling around the country in that big blue van with two children. And it's very good this happened because Simeon was not a good traveler. Not good tra he was not that kind of uh, yes. <laughs> Simeon was a great traveler. <laughs> Simeon, he wasn't having it. So the blessing of the show happening. So he was five months old when we shot the pilot for the show. Wow. Was, 
uh, we introduced the production team to members of the St. Helena Island, the Gullah Geechee community. That's why when uh, the Gullah Gullah Island family left our home, we visited real people who spoke mm -hmm. real, a real language, who lived mm -hmm. from following these certain beliefs, um, who we had uh, the Beaver High School band, and I'm a Beaver High School alum, <laughs> to perform on the program and other community groups. And that was very exciting. So it, it meant a lot, not just for the both of you, but for the entire community. Yes. Yeah, I, I still would find folks who say, oh, Miss Natalie, I was in that episode where this happened, you yeah. know? Because community just come. And, and like, there was a, a shrimper who lived next door Mm -hmm. Mr. Bradley, he really was the shrimp that Ron grew up next door to. Right. Oh, wow. Ranger Mike really was the park ranger out at the beach. Mm -hmm. So this was just um, folk. I men. remember Ranger Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Mike life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you all were, y'all were reality TV before there was reality TV. Like more yeah, or less. Or less. Yeah. <laughs> but you know good and well, in real life, if you are a parent, it take more than 23 minutes to resolve the problem. Right. Yeah, very true, very true. <laughs> but I don't know, I feel like maybe if my parents would have sung me a song or, you know, did an arts and crafts, like something, I think that it could have been resolved in 23 minutes. Those are, things, those are things that we did in, in real life that the production team saw and modeled for the, the TV. Yeah. Gullah Gullah Island family. Yeah. We sang with our kids. We always did. Right. Um, we sang in our house. We always did. And we still do. Many of the songs were spirituals that the uh, that the musical team more or less adapted to a more rhythmic kind of um, performance to our, for a children's song. So it was wow. great. I remember those songs were so powerful because I, I can still remember some to this day. Uh -huh. There was a really great team of, of musicians, um, Billy Coben, Peter Lurie, and Gail, Gail Sky King. King. She was from Barbados. <laughs> so any song you had, you got to have that kind of a bass. Yes. Gail Sky right. King. Yeah. I love that. I the love that. Very similar to Gullah Geechee culture um, and the rhythms of our music. Yes. So there was this diaspora kind, African diasporic uh, mm -hmm. influence or infusion uh, of the show. And there were numerous people around the world who respond to us today that this was the first time in their lives that they saw people who looked like them, who lived like them. And we recently um, uh, visited the International African American Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. And there were many of the curatorial staff who came out, heard that we were there and said, why does know this is Gullah Gullah Island's reason that they're doing what they're doing today. Yes. I think that really just speaks to the impact that you both had on the culture in general. I um, mean, it's definitely it's still relevant today. Yeah. Genuinely, yeah. Very good. Oh, yeah. I'm grateful for Maria Perez saying, hey, maybe we can do a show about you. I really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Got to put in Kathleen. And yeah, Kathleen, yes. Because she's <laughs> okay. Yes, this can be done. Um, and I think it was Kath, Kathy Minton who had, she had worked with puppets before. And that's why, you know, the excitement of Binya Binya yeah. Polywog. And they're asking us for cultural references. Yes. Binya is actually a Gullah Geechee term. I'm a Binya and I'm not a frog or a polywog, but someone who was born in the Gullah Geechee community who has been here or Binya is known as a Binya. And if you double a word in uh, Gullah Geechee, it means very much so. Uh, you can look good or you look good, good, or you look good, good, good. So Binya Binya Paliwag supposedly has been on Gullah Gullah Island for a very long time. <laughs> I love how y'all just broke that down. Like, that's just mind blowing. <laughs> I feel like I'm learning so much in this one conversation. If, if you all can kind of like tell us more about the Gullah Geechee people of South Carolina, I know um, 
you know, I, I know Mr. Ron, that's where you're originally from. Uh, yes. You can tell us more about the history. I'm going to, I'm going to defer to him, but I will say <laughs> that yes. um, Gullah Geechee people aren't just in South Carolina. They're coastal yes. from like um, Northern Florida, like around St. Augustine up to Southern North Carolina. So okay. that's the Georgia coast. It's the rice producing areas of the coastal um, United South, South Southern coastal United it's States. And so now I'm going to just hand that to Ron. But just, okay. Which is recent. No, that's great information. I thought it was just in South Carolina. So it, okay. And they're descendants yeah. of people who have been born in those communities, uh, stretching from Wilmington, North Carolina, down throughout South Carolina, George, all the way down to St. Augustine, Florida, who now live elsewhere and they've taken their culture aspects of our heritage with them. Natalie and I just visited Ghana, West Africa. Um, Right. It's my second visit, and on my first visit to Ghana almost 20 years ago, as soon as the plane landed, I began to see all these people who look like my father's people, and wow. this aunt so-and-so and uncle so-and-so, and, -so and um, people from the St. Helena Island community. Um, and I would had DNA testing done following that visit and the subsequent year visiting Sierra Leone, where I saw people who look like my mother's people and found out that my ancestry is from the Ewe and Akan peoples of Ghana, West Africa. And my maternal lineage is from the Temne people of Sierra Leone. Those uh, Africans who were, who were enslaved and brought to these communities came primarily from the rice coast countries, present day mm -hmm. Gambia, Guinea, Guinea, the South Sierra Leone, and Liberia, but also from non-producing, non-rice producing countries like the Gold Coast countries of Ghana, Togo, Benin, Nigeria, and also West Central African countries, uh, Cameroon, Gabon, uh, Angola. That's where our ancestors hailed from. And uh, Gala sounds a lot like Angola, uh, but most of the Africans who were brought to this country to produce rice came from the rice coast countries. And in Sierra Leone and Liberia, there are tribal groups known as the Golas and the Gizi, spelled K-I-S-S-I, -S -S -I, but pronounced Gizi sounds a lot like Giti. And that, her that African heritage, our spiritual beliefs, our customs, um, our traditions, our food ways, and our language come from those West Africans. And that, in an essence, is what Gullah Geechee heritage is all about. Amazing. And if I'm not mistaken, the, the language is still spoken in those it's specific still, areas. And it is very um, akin to the languages like the Jamaican Patois. And mm -hmm. also, if you were to hear, uh, let's see, people from uh, the Rice Coast countries, uh, the Gold Coast countries who speak English. Um, and many of these were uh, colonized by Britain. But when they speak um, their languages, when they speak English, they sound almost like the Gullah Geechee that you'd hear in the Southeastern United States. Some of the same grammatical rules, like the TH is substituted with a D, uh, S. Words that begin with an S-T-R would be substituted with an S-K-R. Street would be pronounced as street. Um, ask would be pronounced as ax. And for years during my childhood, even today for the most part, uh, it had been considered that those who spoke Gullah Geechee did so because of thick tongues, big lips, or low intelligence as a way of throwing shade at African wow. hair. But it's a great skill for these enslaved people who had never spoken the languages of those with whom they had been enslaved and put on enslaved ships and on uh, enslaved uh, prisons to develop a language uh, that everyone could understand and that has withstood time. And as you said, is still spoken to them. I think that really just speaks to the resilience of our people. It does. Like, like you can literally just just see our um, our swag, like the way even the way we talk. Like, I didn't know that the way ask 
uh, is pronounced like axe. Like I, I say that, and I didn't know that that was a direct connection. <laughs> heritage that's been passed exactly. down generationally. Yes. Uh, or did you think speakers can code switch? We can speak Gullah Geechee, but in, at the appropriate time, we can speak English as well as possible. But that is what known as code switching. And that is something that is helped with the resilience or knowing for teachers to allow their students to know that they can speak a certain way in their homes, but in the uh, environment, the work environment, it's best to be able to be able to switch to speaking English more fluently. Yeah. So, so even thinking about code switching, you both uh, were great examples of what it means to show up authentically uh, to the world, you know, with your culture, with your heritage. And I wonder, like, did you ever experience that pressure to possibly conform to what TV was looking for that to fit in a certain box? Interestingly enough, <laughs> one of the early directors asked Ron if he wanted a, a vocal coach. They're like, uh, no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because this is Gullah Gullah Island. Why would he not want to sound like himself? But at that time, I don't uh, think uh, that director was aware that this was a real program thing. of cultural, a particular of a particular culture. Um, uh, speakers in television and movies are to speak this um, unknown kind of, it's an unreal um, language. I forgot just what it's called. They used to call it a mid-Atlantic yes. accent. Yeah, mm. correct. But, you know. And that's what she was looking for. And I couldn't understand what was different about the way that I spoke. But she heard something different that she did not wish to hear. And at different times when I have done um, auditions for different uh movies or that's that's a whole thing well can you speak um get rid of that accent um can you and i would not well, I, I don't necessarily hear the accent right when i've gotten older i hear it i think it's but when i was younger no i don't i I'm, i don't know what you're talking about but they was a no they, they can't use because they were looking for a different sound wow well, I'm here to say I appreciate that you all didn't <laughs> take the vocal coach because <laughs> it meant so much seeing people who looked like us, who spoke like us uh, on TV. It, it really did. I wonder, did, did that ever happen to, with um, like appearance wise as well? Like, was that ever a conversation? No, 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 not really. It wasn't about our appearance. It wasn't. I mean, I was a full figured woman. So, you know, I got a little pushback in the wardrobe room the first year. Okay, but the second year there was another full figure black woman in running the wardrobe from then on. So you I know, love that. I had to work through my own, and, and also you know things like finding a makeup artist who, like the first season, the the pilot, they had no idea. Ron told the makeup artist during the pilot, he said James's legs are ashy. She went and put water on them. Like, no, 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 that cannot be done. That that <laughs> that is not the solution. <laughs> that, no. But, <laughs> the production team was really um, on top of making sure that everybody then with that was involved with Gullah Gullah Island. Um, they brought in, they brought in Latinx, they brought in Black, they brought in that type of team surrounding us. And that made such a difference. So me being, um, yeah. you know, a bigger Black woman. Am I being a dark complexioned person? Yeah. They had to make sure that lighting was different, that worked well for me as well as yeah. lighter complexion people. Yeah. And they and they did. They they were good they were to do that. Yeah. So that's it was amazing. A positive yeah. experience. Yeah. I didn't feel any and you know, and I had I had all the little locks and braids. I remember the braids. I remember yeah. I love them. <laughs> they asked me, it's like, what should we do with your hair? And I said, Well, you know, I did I did the black girl thing. We're gonna be so we're gonna do we need to braid this. <laughs> 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 and then we don't have a problem. And so I ended up going up to Brooklyn to Kemet Kinks. I don't know if they're still there. And they would gave me that little pixie braid. I swear it took like it felt like it took a week. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that and so I got to be we got to be ourselves. And you know, just a little aside. One day, some years after the show ended, or maybe the show had just about ended, a white woman and her little girl had come up to me, 
And the woman said, you know, my daughter, she just loves you so much and she wants hair like yours. And I keep telling her, but your hair is pretty. And that was a mind blowing because I grew up with, you know, you always wanted hair, like long straight hair like this. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this little white girl, she wanted hair like mine. Wow. I was like, wow. wow. Yeah. Wow. I, I really think that that speaks so much too about how you all influence a culture that outside of our own as yeah. well um, mm -hmm. as a result of like showing up as yourself. Even, you know, thinking about the children that you've impacted. Um, again, me at my big age, like <laughs> I remember <laughs> the... <laughs> I remember the songs. I remember, you know, learning like the funga, a lafia. I say, like, I remember that. Like, I can still sing that today. Um, and that really brought about a sense of. While the show was in production, we would be uh, in airports. There would be college, university students who would see us and who would tell us they skipped classes daily to watch the first, to watch the show. <laughs> I believe that. Like, <laughs> we woke up early in the morning in the summertime to watch the show. So I can see that. Um, and it, it really played a role in like, you know, our mental health and building self-esteem of black children. And I wonder like, was that intentional? Did you know the, the mental health impacts that you were gonna have on this generation? Oh, no, we had no idea what the mm -hmm. would be, but we knew what we wanted for our kids. That's what we knew. Mm -hmm. We knew that there was nobody who looked like my daughter or our son that they could see on any consistent basis. And we wanted that. So, um, but we weren't thinking what will be the mental health impact, you know, 20, 30 now years out. And I have to say that one of the blessings of being a healthy person in my senior years is that I keep meeting these amazing people like you who say, wow, the work that you did made such a difference in our life. And that's like, that's wonderful. We we didn't know. We didn't know. We were um, wow. storytellers and performers. And what we did know was that we dedicated our lives to telling the stories of our people. That mm -hmm. was, that's purpose. That's the purpose. Do that's what you do. That's what you do. And what I say now is that our families, our family's motto is Sankofa. Everything we do is Sankofa. We knew that. But we had no idea how that was going to play out. <laughs> I love that. The fact that you all were able to and willing to kind of put yourselves out there, put your culture out there, and it made such a significant impact beyond what you were even imagining. Um, it really speaks to the dedication that you have for the work. But um, there's, there are certain aspects that were just germane to who we were as parents or being the products of the communities into which we were born. Um, during one of the early seasons um, with the influence of the puppet characters, it seemed like the puppets were the ones who were handling all of the conflict and the children and we said, no, 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 well, we think, we find that the parents are the ones that need to be utilized. During the first season, um, some of the production team, uh, they had an issue with our being addressed as Mr. Ron or Miss Natalie and just should be Natalie or Ron. No, 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 no. No, y'all, no, we don't do that. You got to <laughs> No, we don't. We don't do that. And they followed through. They, yeah, and so, yes, the, the production team, they were, always really responsive, okay. really responsive to what, what we shared about the culture and what we knew about um, our community. And in our community, you respect your elders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we could, not, we, could not model, we could not model something that we would not allow in our home. Right. Exactly. And my children still love you. They're your peers. They're like, they still <laughs> like Miss, Miss Barbara and Miss, you know, Miss, but I do too. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm an elder, but there are people who are my elders. Mm -hmm. And when I address my elders, I give them a title. Unless exactly. they asked me not to. Right. I just exactly do. that is a cultural norm. And mm -hmm. yeah, to this to this day, if there are younger or much younger 
interviewers who address me as Ron. Wait, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that just made me cringe a little bit. Are they doing that? <laughs> well, well, we don't know each other like that. Uh, there are one thing, it was in 2005, I participated in a very historic trip to Sierra Leone. It's one of the Gullah Geechee homecomings. Halfway around the world, we were on a ferry to uh, Bunce Island, which is one of the slave prisons where a number of Africans who had been enslaved last saw their homelands when they were boarded on ships from Bunce Island. Well, on this ferry, because we were wearing our Priscilla's homecoming, a Gullah homecoming t-shirts, someone on the ferry asked um, the coordinator, not knowing it was the coordinator of the trip, is that Gullah, as in Gullah, Gullah Island? And he said, why, yes. And the star of the, that show is right over there. And he came smiling, wanting to take um, a selfie uh, with me for his four or six year old son. He was a Nigerian living in Germany who watched the show daily with his son. And he wanted me to know how much he enjoyed the colors, the people, the language of that show. It related to him so very closely to how he had grown up in his Nigerian home. I love that. And, you know, I know I keep talking about the impact, but I really hope that you guys feel as though you're getting your flowers today because you certainly deserve them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you received an email, something on social media, recently from a young woman who had watched yeah them. this was a, a letter i got from a young white woman who grew up in um a midwestern some very very white place where she had never seen a real black person wow and she grew up she and her little brother in a very racist home but they watched mm -hmm. every day and she said um i watched you every day and i loved you and because of you my brother and i did not grow up like that and eventually I was able to impact my parents and I'm a teacher now. And honestly, I, it just makes me really, I'm like, yes. you don't, you don't know, you don't mm -hmm. know. And so I think something, yeah, I'll, I'll just move quickly through that, that sometimes you do what you're led to do. And for mm -hmm. us, that was this work. And when we, I will say that it wasn't always easy because people didn't actually understand what we were doing. Mm -hmm. We're telling these stories, even before Gullah Gullah Island, we're telling these stories and we're singing these songs. And there are people who are like, first, why are you singing all that old stuff? Why are you telling the stories about what used to be? And also, um, when we were pregnant with my son and then we were like, we need to do something different. There was also the kind of advice like, well, okay, y'all have fun playing around now. <laughs> y'all need to just go get a real job, you know, like with... The jobs that we were often funneled into um, in the sure. black uh, education, social work, um, there is room for you there. Mm -hmm. If you want to do something good, then you go work for the system. And we were like, that's not it. Mm -hmm. We don't know what it is, but we know that's exactly. Right. And so to be here now to look and say the impact that we were able to make by not following that guidance is so much more <laughs> than if I had just been sitting up working in DSS office, just waiting yeah. for my pension. And I'm not saying that's all that's done there. That's right. they do work. They do very hard work. But that wasn't our work. This was our work. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer that you know that that's your that was your purpose yeah. to tell these stories to impact the lives of children throughout generations, throughout nations as well. Um, I wonder, like, could there ever be a chance of there being a, a reboot or? <laughs> there very I well, would love that. There very well may be a reboot. And if Wait. there is, we don't know anything about it. <laughs> no, 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 um, okay. It's a Viacom product. Um, our son has expressed an interest in a variation of a uh, Gullah Gullah Island type of show. And maybe that may come into being. Yeah, he's he's done a whole um what do you call it? Make a 
Bible. Like a Bible, a press book, a thing on a variation of Gullah Gullah Island or Gullah yeah. Island. But so what he's thinking, like, you know how they redid the Fresh Prince? Yes. So for a slightly different audience, it's more sophisticated. That's what he's playing with. Okay. And he's in LA doing stuff. So who knows? Mm -hmm. What we told him is we love you, Simeon. And he said, well, if I do it, you know, you're going to help. You're going to get involved. I, said, I will get involved to the level that you want me to. Because that's my son. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, well speaking for... <laughs> right? <laughs> speaking for, you know, the millennials out there, we would love to see that. We really would. So if it does happen, for sure, for sure. Um, do you guys have anything coming up or anything that we can, um, you know, support you on? We Nell got has stuff. A book. Nell has okay. A book. Okay. We both have books coming out. <laughs> so October 10th is when my book release is a children's book. I wrote it and illustrated it. It's called Okra Stew, a Gullah Geechee family celebration. Um, it's published by um, Charles Holt Imprint of Macmillan Publishing. So you can pre order now in all the places where you can pre order books. Tell everybody. Tell everybody. So I'm really pleased and proud of that book. I am an artist. I'm a visual artist. And so um, I, I paint, uh, I tell stories that way a lot. And so um, you can see my work here and there and there and there, but it'll be in this book. And Ron has a book coming out. Yes, this year. I have a book entitled Raptors in the Rice Lands. It's an historical um, fiction uh, novel about a uh, a fictional Gullah Geechee community of Georgetown, South Carolina. And it tells about uh, just the use, the connections of Gullah Geechee and other um, African diasporic communities. There is a couple who wishes, it's a twist on philanthropy, and they learn different aspects about giving, giving, and the expectations of giving and helping and leaving a legacy uh, for their children. That will be by Brandy Lane Publishing. The publication date has not been set. I've been told it will be this fall. And Natalie and I will be republishing uh, several books that have been out of print for a while. And that includes the very first one that we began during uh, our uh, sea Island montage performance with, and that book was Reminiscences of Sea Island Heritage, Freedmen um, of St. Helena Island, uh, also Gullah Branches with African Roots, which uh, was a uh, prequel, a, a sequel, uh, almost 20 years later. Uh, wow. It's the same way, but um, in that book, I told tell about the, the songs, uh, well, I would hear these old spirituals during my trips to Ghana and Sierra Leone, and I use new lyrics to the tunes of these old spirituals, plus writings about the experiences. Gullah Branches, West African Roots. There's a children's book uh, that we have self-published called Little Muddy Waters, a Gullah folk tale about this mischievous little boy whose grandma kept uh, having to remind him to mind your manners and do what's right. And also there's the Gullah Storybook, a counter uh, for the numbers one through 10. So hopefully by the end of, of summer, early fall, those will be re-released. Um, and also we uh, developed uh, a set, it's called Gullah Easy Wisdom Cards, and that will come back into uh, into production also the, around the same time that these books are reintroduced. That's amazing. You have a lot going on. There's a lot going on. I was listening to him and I just wanted to lie down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like... <laughs> but I, I think that's just a testament of how much you all are doing for the culture. Like, amazing. So we have multiple books. We have like so many things lined up. Yeah. Um, if you all don't mind, uh, Miss Natalie, if you can email me the links to like the books and you know everything that you guys have lined up, and we'll put it in the show notes so that our viewers can watch. I will do that, and I'll also share my website because I say I'm an artist. I'd love folk to look. Yes. I have original art, but I also have prints, which folk may be interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been doing. A little, I, we're 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 fairly busy. Yeah. 
but we are busy absolutely doing what we're, we're living in purpose. So we're, we're living in sure. Purpose. So, um, you know, there are days like today, Ron came out to my art studio and he's saying, have you done this and this? And I was like, <laughs> so I spent most of today, I walked out of the studio and I sat on the porch and I watched the birds and the butterflies and all that. And that's what I did today. I sat on the porch and I love it. I get back into the studio. I have paintings to do. I have commissions to complete. Mm -hmm. Um, and we have books. We have <laughs> and two years ago, um, I released um, two novellas. Uh, they're called my Gichi Literature Series. Uh, the titles are We Wear the Mask, Unravel Truths in a Pre-Gullah Community, and Turtle Dove Done Drooped His Wings, A Gullah Tale of Fight or Flight. They're sold on um, Amazon.com and also my Etsy shop. Geechee Literature um, and uh, dot com. And I have been baking Mr. Ron's Gullalicious Pow Cakes. I saw that on Instagram. I need a pound cake. There's a <laughs> pound cake. They're available. I need a pound cake. Yeah, that, I have to say that that was a, that was a definite courtship thing. Um, <laughs> Invited me out to dinner. I walked in the house and he pulled the cake out the oven. I smelled like melted butter and sugar. I saw I okay. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> so I need Mr. Ron to uh, teach these young men now how to court with the pound cakes. <laughs> Let me tell you, I mean, yeah, it's nice that you got a good car. I appreciate that. That's nice. Can you bake? Can you bake? <laughs> Can I get a pound cake out of this? Can I get a cake out of this? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Natalie's father baked. Yes. I baked. Mm -hmm. So our daughter, Sarah, um, when her uh, grandmother spoke about baking a cake, she was baffled. She's like, mm -hmm. ladies don't <laughs> bake. Ladies don't bake. <laughs> 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 and I held that true. I do not bake. I do not. Here's ideally food that I eat shows up. <laughs> When I eat it. <laughs> Ideally, I have nothing to do with the production. I will pay for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. And both of our children. Sally and I are on the same boat. <laughs> they would go to, um, you know, out with their friends, their homes, and oh no, that's box cake. I, yeah, they, they weren't eating no box cake. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, Mr. Ryan, you you baked on the show as well, right? Yes, because yes, that's one of the things that the creative team saw. Yes. And they followed us around. Yeah, they just week. they really did just mm -hmm. say, you be yourselves. Yeah. That's, and I love that's it. Like big fat biscuits. They saw me baking biscuits. He makes great biscuits. <laughs> and he would bake them every weekend for the kids. There was the biscuits. And there was one biscuit that he called the daddy biscuit because it was the biggest biscuit. When you had all the dough left after you cut all the other ones, he would make one big biscuit, the daddy biscuit. And oh. my children wanted the daddy biscuit. Well, he's the daddy. Yeah. But there are always <laughs> and we get the daddy biscuit, the big, the big biscuit. You know, that's what uh, <laughs> they want to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get in so much trouble. I'm supposed to be doing keto, which is low carb, but I'm going to have to get me a Ron. <laughs> I'm doing keto. I've been doing keto since January, which means I walk into the house from the studio and it smells like cake, but I don't eat it. That's willpower. Mm -hmm. But that is willpower. do not think that I have not had my share of cake. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> We've been married for 38 years. 38 years? That's right. This November. Congrats. Well, I've had my share of cake. I have not. <laughs> yeah. So you go ahead. Amazing. Before the keto. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm certainly going to order one of the pound cakes. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> oh, well, it was definitely. Yeah. Yeah. If you can came about because um, when I started baking for the public, that was after Gullah Gullah Island had ended, and I'd find the customers. They would tell me they would put the cake boxes below their beds or in their closets because the cake was for them. It was for no one else in their family or household. So it was like, oh, share a slice if you can. If you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you know it's good. <laughs> <laughs>
Awesome. Well, it was definitely a pleasure having the both of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Of course. It was. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you say that again? I hope we didn't derail you. You know. No. Thank this you. was a genuine conversation. I'm, you know, <laughs> talking to two of my heroes from childhood. So I'm, I'm good. This was a, a pleasure just to be in your presence. I'm really appreciative. Yeah, thank you. Yes, for sure, for sure. Um, so if it's not too much, would you mind closing us out in the Gullah Gullah Island theme song? <laughs> we should, we should have that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, in um in Ghana recently, that was just last week. Uh, and Natalie had gone up on this suspension bridge. I'd been 20 years ago, so I didn't go this time. I was in the museum and I turned the corner and there was someone. She said, I know you. you um, have you been on TV? Yes. I said, um, what, what, what have you been on? And I said, go, go, go. Yes. That's my kid. I've been telling her child about this show, this amazing show with people like us who, um, she was from New York, she said, and um, they need more shows like that. And of course, she, now, could you sing? She warned her, her daughter oh. to take a picture. Would you sing? Sing this? <laughs> and then so I said, well, go ahead. And she started, but you're not singing. She said, <laughs> well, come and let's play together in the bright sunny weather. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Lots to see and to do there. All we need now is you there. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Just take your foot in your hand. That means hurry up and don't miss the good things that we planned. So come and let's play together in the bright sunny weather. Let's all go to Gullah Gullah Island. Gullah Gullah Island. Gullah Gullah Island. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was amazing. That was amazing. I appreciate the both of you from the bottom of my heart. I really do. Thank you. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So, yes, I will definitely contact you all um, regarding those links in the show notes. And we're here to support in whatever way we can. Thank, Thank you. you very much. much awesome. Absolutely. Thank you again for coming. Okay. okay.